Praise God. Hallelujah. God bless you this morning. My favorite part to that song is, it says, you don't know. <laughs> I don't know what you went through when you came to Jesus Christ. Some of you, it might be sickness that brought you to him. Some of you were on your last, might be suicide. Some of you are strung out on drugs, maybe alcoholics, but we don't know. But what we are thankful is we're all here today. Yes. We're all here today, and God deserves the glory for that. Turn your Bibles to Joel chapter 3, verse 14. The Lord gave me this word about a year ago, and uh, somebody told me, boy, we haven't seen you in a while, and I guess it's been a while since I've been here, so I get to, pre I get to preach it to you today. When you have it, say amen. Joel 3.14. The word of the Lord says, multitudes, multitudes, in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. Father, we come before you. We thank you. Lord, we just love that your presence is here. We felt it in worship. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Lord, when we are unfaithful, you are still faithful. Lord, when we turn our backs, you're still there. You said you would never leave us nor forsake us. Great is thy faithfulness. Father, we stand in awe of you. And we thank you. Thank you, Jesus. I was on my way to hell the Lord, you, your, your blood that you, you shed redeemed me. The atonement on the cross, Lord, was for us. We are the apple of your eye. So, Father, we thank you. Thank you, Lord, for that horrible and glorious day. That day you hung on the cross. But, Lord, you said it is finished. What was finished is there'd be no more sacrifices that was needed. You paid it all for us. Thank you, Lord, that you rose again, and Lord, that you're coming back for us. We thank you for that, Lord, and we bless your wonderful name. Amen. Amen. Title of my sermon today is Almost. Almost. Look at someone and say, Almost. <laughs> How many ever have almost been in an accident? You're like, Whew, that was close. Almost. The Bible says in 2 Chronicles 16, 9, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. I want you to understand something. The Word of God is all about Him. I heard this this last week, and it just it just resonated with me. It just like pfft. we had a devotion, and um, Doctor Trammell got up and said this. He said, "I can tell you from Genesis to Exodus. I can sum it up in two words." Genesis, I'm sorry, Genesis to Malachi. And of course, 
he says that and it catches all our attention. How are you going to do that? And the two words were this. From Genesis to Malachi, the words were, he's coming. It was all about Jesus. And then he goes, I can I could tell you from Matthew to Acts in two words. He came. <laughs> from Romans to Revelation, I could tell you two words. Or three. He's coming back. It's all about Jesus. This book is all about him. You can take stuff from it and apply it to your life, but it's not about you. It's about the redemptive power of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ who was prophesied to come. He came and he's coming back for us. That's what this book is about. It's not about me. My job is to read this book and follow what it says to the, to the letter. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro. They're looking. It's, they're looking for somebody whose heart is devoted to him. Think about it. Are you completely devoted to him? Let's go back four years now. And we're, going, we're, we're about to complete our fifth year of COVID. Or fourth year. Uh, one of those. What did COVID do to the church? People have left, but people left and they didn't return. It's a slow, slow process that people coming back. Why? Because of fear. This scared them into believing that they are missing something. And the church is just a place where we will go only in a family emergency. This is what COVID did. And then the churches were told to shut down. You guys remember that? Oh, you got to shut down. Give us two weeks. I want to tell you today. I want you to leave this place encouraged today. Okay? That the word of God stands. Yes. That the word of God is not going to be swayed in any way. What he said yesterday still applies today, and it will apply after we're gone. The Bible says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will remain forever. It's his word. He said it. So let's, let's stop thinking about what could be and begin to understand what has been done for us. Oh, Lord, I sound like Kamala. Sorry about that. Uh, we got to understand, God has done something wonderful for us, okay? And let me preface it by saying that. God has done something wonderful for us. Sorry about that. In Acts chapter 26, verse 27 and 28, the Bible says this. It's a conversation between King Agrippa and Paul. And remember, the title of this message is Almost. Paul looks at King Agrippa and he says this, King Agrippa, do you believe in the prophets? And then he says, I know that you do believe. Then Agrippa said to Paul, and this is where I really want to, for this to hit home today. Agrippa said to Paul, you almost persuade me to become a Christian. Almost. The problem in our churches is there's a lot of people almost persuaded. Um, before, I don't want to jump ahead of myself, so let's, let's move on here. The word almost is not a power word. How many married couples in here? If you told your spouse, I love you, would you like their response to say, I almost love you? <laughs> you wouldn't like that, would you? But, Brother Rick, isn't that what we do to God? The Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And what do we do? Ah, I almost love you, God. We're like King Agrippa. I'm almost convinced to be a Christian. The word almost is not a power word. It's not a word that describes champions or people who have accomplished something. 
Now, I've been, to, uh, I've been to Nepal, and I've seen the top of Mount Everest. I can say that, but I have not climbed Mount Everest. There's a difference. I was in a plane looking at the top. Others climbed it. So I can't say that I, was, I did it. Okay? I, play, I tried out for the Denver Gold when they were here. Do you guys remember that? Is, is that a past memory? I tried out... Uh, I can't even say I almost got in. There was guys so fast, I didn't even, they were a blur when they ran by me. I said, yeah, I shouldn't have eaten those enchiladas this morning. So, uh, <laughs> the, tr- to be truthful, the word almost is a negative word. Almost. I got a couple of things here. Does anybody recognize this? All right. Then anybody recognize this one? Okay. If you were like me and this was your standard uh, ribbon at the end of a race, well, you understand. All right. So how many of you have young men in your family uh, that are in school right now, grade school, junior high, or high school? All right. When I was a kid, we had field day. And can I say this? We had real field day. Oh, I think you know what I mean. And the goal was this. That was the goal right there. And how would you like it if you're... How many of you guys have sons? Okay. How would you like it if your son came and said, Dad... You should have seen me at field day today. I was amazing. Man, I I tore it up. And here's my proof, Dad. How many of you fathers would look at it and say, Son, we need to talk. Well, how many were in that race? And your son starts saying, "I I came in fifth, and there was two other guys ahead of me. What? You came in that late, and there was only two other guys ahead of you? Son, we need to talk. You didn't win anything. See, the problem is we come to church the same way. Oh, Lord, let me give you what I got. Let me just give you what I can throw at you. I'm not going to even try. I'm not going to even work out. I'm not going to even practice. Let me just give you what I got. See, God is looking for this. See, it's not about winning and losing. It's about finishing the race. The story goes of a guy named John Akwari who uh, represented his nation in the 72 Olympics, I believe. And uh, he was a marathon runner. And during the beginning of the race, they started, uh, they started all together, you know, as the pack does, and they start running. He fell, and he was kind of trampled on. He uh, dislocated his knee, and he uh, received other injuries in the race. But he got up and he kept running. An hour after the awards had been given, here comes John Aquari to finish the race. When he got there, hardly anybody was there. The stadium was empty. The the, uh, the event was closed down already. So somebody that had waited caught him and said, why did you finish the race? And John responded this way. My country didn't send me 5,000 miles to start the race. They sent me 5,000 miles to finish the race. God did not save you just to start the race. God saved you to finish this race and to finish strong. Agrippa said, I'm almost persuaded. And now I've already said it. There are too many people in churches that are almost persuaded. 10 o'clock service, people are coming to church. They do it because this is what we do. We come to church. We enjoy a little bit of music. We give a little bit of offering. And we go home. We've almost persuaded them. Some of you are in that boat today. In this culture and where we're heading as a nation, 
you cannot afford to stay in the valley of decision. Paul wrote to the Corinthians, he said, Do you not know that those who run in a race run all, but one receives the prize? So run in such a way that you can obtain it. So I'm going to give you seven examples of almost. Number one, Judas. Wow. Wow. What a guy to pick for number one, eh? but this, this is true. Listen to this. Judas walked and talked with Jesus and to Jesus and lived with the disciples. He saw Jesus perform miracles. And I'm going to go out on a big old limb here. I believe that, G, uh, that Judas had the same power as the other disciples. I believe that Judas performed miracles. Huh. Number two, Pilate. Pilate was face to face with Jesus. <laughs> and Pilate asked Jesus right there. See, Pilate in his heart, he knew. He knew that it was wrong. He knew what they were doing was wrong. And in his heart, he knew that. And he wanted to talk to Jesus. And he said, listen, I can make this better. I, I, have this, I have the power to give you life or death. And what was Jesus' response? He goes, you only have the power that God gave you. And we need to understand as the church that the power that God gives us, we can get through life. We can get through this cultural uh, divide. We can get through all these things because God has sanctioned it for his church. Amen. Pilate asked Jesus, what is truth? Pilate couldn't comprehend it. He just couldn't get it. Jesus looked right back at him. And they got this eye contact going on. But what Pilate didn't understand, he was standing in front of the way, the truth, and the life right there. All he had to do was say, Lord, here am I. But Pilate missed the boat. Hmm. Number three. Barabbas. Jesus took the place of a notorious outlaw who committed murder and led a rebellion. I think I might say that again because it just kind of hit me. Jesus took the place of a notorious outlaw who committed murder and led a rebellion. Barabbas was standing right there. The people didn't want him. All they wanted is for Jesus to be gone. I said this in uh, this morning's sermon. In the Democratic Party, uh, the, the, the convention, uh, Kamala Harris was speaking. And she was going on and on about abortion and all that, the freedom of that. And two young men, one sounded, shouted out, Jesus is Lord. And another one sounded, shouted, Jesus is King. And her response was, you do not belong in this event right here. The world is trying to tell the church, we do not belong, but we know what God has said. God has said, I have put you there. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Barabbas was standing right there. Probably like, wow, what is going on? Barabbas turns and goes free. And Jesus takes his place. Malchus. Malchus was touched by the hand of Jesus and healed. When? At the garden just before Jesus was crucified. It would be Jesus' last miracle that he did. To a soldier who was there to take him away. What did Jesus do? He bends down, picks up Malchus' ear, and he heals him. Number six, the other thief on the cross. Oh, we could preach the thief on the cross. That's good preaching material right there. We could talk about how he turned to God and everything was good. And this day you will be with me in paradise. We all want to hear those words. There were two thieves, but only one salvation. 
Both thieves had the opportunity to enter paradise. I want you to hear something this morning. The Bible says, two will be out in the field, one will be taken, and one left. Which one are you going to be? Both thieves had the opportunity to enter paradise. Only one did. Why? The other thief never admitted he was wrong. Wow. Do we have that problem going on today? Nobody wants to take their part of what has happened. No one wants to take the blame. It was somebody else. Somebody else did it. She did. We all have siblings. We've all turned our siblings in, threw them under the bus. It wasn't me. We were driving down the road when my girls were small, and uh, we were driving down the road, and we are just a peaceful, nice drive, and suddenly my youngest daughter lets out this blood-curdling scream. Ah! You know, and it scared us. So I, I turn around, and, and my wife looks at them. What's going on? Sarah, what happened? And Sarah said, Megan pinched me. And June looked at Megan and said, Megan, did you pinch her? She goes, I didn't feel myself, Pincher. <laughs> Isn't that the way we do as Christians? I didn't feel myself do that, Lord. I didn't feel myself sin. I didn't feel myself gossip. I didn't feel myself whatever. You fill in the blank. Hmm. He didn't want to admit he was wrong. Carefully listen to this. He was only looking for a way out of his current situation. Man, Pastor Joe, how many people have come and said, you know, Pastor, pray for me. I'll give the Lord my life if he saves me from this. And it happens, and then they're gone. That's all he wanted, just out of the current situation. Get me off this cross. Uh, you're okay, dude, right on. I'm out of here. And that's what people do. Oh, I went to church. Church was good, but I don't need to go back. Hmm. Number seven, the five virgins. They had oil, but not enough. Hmm. Boy, you, but man, never heard that one before, huh? They did have oil, but not enough. They knew the groom was coming. He was on his way, but they were not prepared not prepared they had a form of godliness but denied his power I believe the church has found themselves in one of these areas one or more of these areas again our churches are filled with almost Christians. You know, I'm Hispanic. I'm not almost Mexican. I'm not. I, I am. That's what I am. I can't be telling people I'm almost this. You know, I am what I am. I am a Christian. I am a follower of Christ. That's who I am. Okay, I... You can try anything you want to to derail me from that, but it's not going to happen. What does the old song say? I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. See, I don't want to see what's going on back there. I want to see what he has for me. See, I know what's going on, death and destruction, but Jesus, but what did, what did Moses tell the people in Deuteronomy chapter 8, 28, uh, chapter, chapter 28? He said this, Today, I, st I, give you, I give you two things. You can either go for death or go for life. But then he said, choose life. So in 1972, July of 1972, at 10 years old, I decided that I would choose life. I gave my heart to Christ. And I want those young people that are in here, I want you to understand today, you can give your heart to Christ today and you can live a good life for him and he will come back. For you. Hmm. So where do we stand? Let's, let's bring this home with those seven things. 
Judas had access to Jesus. You have access to Jesus. <laughs> Call on me, says the Lord. Call on my name. That's what it says. You have access. Now, I'm going to let the pastors give them a free ride today, uh, Brother Rick. Listen, every time you fall apart, guess who you're calling? The pastor. But guess what? You have access to Jesus. The Bible says, come forth boldly to the throne room of grace. You have the same access that they do. You don't need their prayer, although it's great. It's good when they do pray for you. But guess what? You can call on God yourself. Pilate spoke directly to Jesus. You can speak directly to him. You know what I do now every time I lay down? I quote the 23rd Psalm, but I make it personal. I say, you are my shepherd. I shall not want. You make me lie down in green pastures. You lead me beside the still waters. And I like this part the most. You restore my soul. Oh, my goodness. You talking about laying down and going, ah, man, I feel restored. The day, the heaviness of the day, the hardships of the day, all that stuff begins to drift away. He restored my soul. Even though you take me through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Your rod and thy staff, they come for me. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely, goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. Did you hear that? Not riches and answers, not that. Goodness and mercy will follow me. And I will dwell, and here's how I tell him, in your house forever. Wow. Pilate spoke directly to Jesus. You can speak directly to him. Well, I know you've done it too. When you're going down the road and you, if you're from Colorado, the roads get icy. And you begin to hit that ice and right away the song comes, Jesus, take the wheel. You get into concert right there. Jesus, take the wheel and you're all over the place. And when he does and you stop, oh, thank you, Jesus. You didn't say, Pastor Joe, take the wheel. <laughs> Believe me, if you'd have said that, you'd be crashed. In oh, never mind. We won't go that way. Okay. <laughs> Barabbas was released. Some of you need to be released. I don't know what's going on in your life. Anger. Pornography, drugs, alcohol. You need to be released. Let Jesus take it for you. The word says, cast your cares upon him because he cares for you. Let him take it. Release it. Let it go. Don't grab for it back. Let it go. You know, they said there's nothing stronger than when you're trying to get something out of a toddler's hand. So try to imagine, when you're doing that to Jesus, you look just like a toddler. Give it. Give. That's mine. That's mine. Release it. Let him have it. All right. Malchus was healed by Jesus. Many of you, and I, I like this one because I get to go home and not have to deal with it after. So, okay. Many of you have been healed by Jesus. Amen? Amen. Come on, who's bold enough to say, Lord, heal me? Okay. And yet you do nothing. Sorry. I'm putting this up so nobody throws anything at me. And yet you do nothing. Hmm. Bible says in Matthew chapter 8, Now when Jesus had come into Peter's house, he saw his, his mother's, uh, I'm sorry, he saw his wife's mother lying sick with a fever. So he touched her hand and the fever left. I'd like to leave it right there. But the rest of the word says, And she arose and served them. 
If God has healed you, and if you're not serving in any way, shape, or form, shame on you. He did it because he needs for you to do what he's called you to do, and he healed you for that reason. Oh, okay, it's gotten kind of quiet in here. That one hurts. That one hurts because God heals us, and then we go back to the same thing we are doing. When God is saying, no, I didn't heal you for that. I healed you so that you can work. My brother over here was saying, listen, we're going to have, I think, music. You're going to get people together for music and try to do something like that. Well, guess what? You heard the word today. Don't don't be sitting there going, well, no, no, no. You heard the word. If God healed you and you're musically inclined, your booty needs to be up here. Okay? I heard this quote two weeks ago, and it just stuck with me. Your contribution is not your ability. Your contribution is your availability. I played the drums two weeks ago for you guys, huh? I got on the drums. Drummer wasn't here. I said, I'll go play the drums. I wasn't sure about the music you were doing, so I thought, I better not try because uh, I might mess them all up. But they were doing some old coritos. I said, I could do those. Your contribution is not your ability. Stop thinking that you're all that. You know, God can raise, what did he say? I can raise rocks up to praise me if I need to. And some of you are so hard-headed that uh, maybe he did. I don't know. (laughs) But your contribution is your availability. What do you need, pastor? What can we do at the church? That's the availability God is looking for because when you do that, he begins to form you and push you in the direction that he's called you. But if you do nothing, don't expect anything. Did I miss five? I must have missed five, didn't I? I did. Well, you're going to get all of five in one shot. The rich young ruler. That, That was that new math they teach. I just skipped right over five, so sorry about that. The rich young ruler loved his money and lifestyle more than Jesus. In the church... I could care less outside of the church. But in the church, money and lifestyle has been the downfall of many. I got to go to work. I got to work. I, I, you know, I, I got bills to pay, blah, 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 blah. What happened to trust in the Lord? Lean not unto your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. What happened to, if I bring my tithe and my offering to the storehouse, God would open up the windows of heaven, pour me out a blessing that no one can contain. What happened to that? See, we stop believing what the Bible says by going away from what the Bible says. I need to work harder. I need to put in more hours. Let me bring you down a bit. God knows what you need. Before you even ask. Hmm. The other thief had the same opportunity. Christ has given you an opportunity to escape. Deliverance and escape. Wow. It's like he handed you a key. I actually have a key in here. Let me see if I do. Yeah. So listen, dude. I'm going to give you a way to escape. I'm going to give you the key to the door. We know that Christ does not need a key. Because while Peter was sleeping, the angel... See, uh, here's another thing, guys. I want to tell you this. You're living in a life in a, of turmoil and of, wor- and of worry and uh, nights that have no peace in them because, oh, what do, what do I got to do next? Peter was in prison. What was Peter doing? He was asleep. Some of you have sleepless nights because you're trying to figure it all out. The Bible says that he gives his beloved rest. That's what you need. You need to rest. Peter was sacked out so much so that the angel came in and had to kick him. Peter, dude, get up. What was Paul and Silas doing? They were singing. They were having church. Let's sing. To God be the glory. Other, uh, other prisoners like, oh, shut up. 
I remember when I was going through, uh, by the way, thank you to all the veterans. I see, uh, sir, thank you for your service. I thank you very much. And Joe, thank you for your service as well. When I was going through basic training, I remember in the, I was in the showers and I was singing Amazing Grace. That rubbed a lot of guys the wrong way. See, a lot of times guys join because they want to get away from all this stuff. But it's, the truth is, it's this stuff that kept us glued together. It's this stuff that kept my mind right. It's this stuff that kept needles out of my body. It's this stuff that I don't drink. This is the stuff that Jesus has put in me that says, Lord, you are Lord of my life. I, told my, I said at 15, I will never mark my body with a tattoo. And I'm not shaming anybody. If you have one, that's your thing. But I told Jesus I would not mark my body. And to this day, I haven't marked my body. Okay, it's that kind of stuff, that kind of peace that we have in Jesus. The five virgins had oil, but not enough. The oil they had was just a pretense of serving God. Huh. I'll look good. I'll wave my hands. I'll get up, sit down when they tell me to. I'll look good. My desire... My prayer for this church is that the Holy Spirit moves in a place, this place. And I'm not talking, uh, uh, Brother Rick, about those, those services where everybody's falling over chairs. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about people whose lives are changed by the power of the Holy Spirit. You came in one way and you're going out a new man, a new woman, a new child. They did not have a full measure of the Holy Spirit. So that brings us to this. Bible says in Matthew chapter 7, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Have we not cast out demons in your name? And done many wonders in your name. And let me stop right there. Let me just tell you something. The Bible says the word of God would not return void. Do you know how many? This is a rhetorical question, okay? Only answer this in your head. How many of you have a relative that you know he just, he's just a liar? <laughs> It might be you. I don't know. It's, how, how many of you, you have, you have that one relative, he know, you know he's just lying? It, it goes this way. He's telling you something. He knows, or no, you know he's lying. He knows that you know he's lying. And you know that he knows that you know he's lying. Right? And he's just going to lie anyway. <laughs> it's the same way. With this list, in your name, we prophesy. We cast out demons. We've done many wonders. See, the name of Jesus, the, the word won't return void. It's powerful. Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me. You who practice lawlessness. Huh. Almost. Today, leave this place, not almost. Be fully committed to the Lord Jesus Christ. Be fully committed to the kingdom of heaven. Be fully committed to the power of the Holy Spirit. We have two sides that are watching us. The Bible says in the book of Hebrews, there is a great cloud of witnesses. Say, come on. Finish the race. You can do it. But then there's that other side that says, why didn't you ever tell me? Why didn't you live the life you talked about? Oof. Second, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9 says, but I discipline my body and I bring it under, to, under subjection. Lest or for fear that when I have preached to others, I myself should be disqualified. 
I don't want to be disqualified. That's why I'm standing up here today to tell you, listen, people, listen, young men, listen, old people, whatever we have in here, don't, uh, don't be an almost Christian. Be fully committed to Christ. I don't want to be disqualified. I don't want you to be disqualified. I want you to make heaven your home. Paul also said, examine yourselves as, whether to, as, as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless indeed you are disqualified. There's that one again. Matthew wrote, then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone comes to me, comes after me, let him deny himself. Uh, can you guys come on up? Let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life is going to lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it to man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? What does it profit you to come to church every Sunday, come to every weekday service, and you still don't believe? It profits you nothing. But where you gain profit is when you come in, you come to this altar, and you repent and say, Lord, I am sorry. I admit what I've done. I repent from those things. I want you to be the Lord of my life. Hmm. Or what will a man, here we go, give in exchange for his soul? Hmm. Ask yourself, what, I've, what have I exchanged for my soul? Anger? How about this one? This one seems to run very deep in the Hispanic community. Bitterness. Unforgiveness. Resentment. Pleasure. Money. The, the list goes on. But guess what? The exchange can happen today. This altar is not just to look good. Anytime you see an altar in the church, there's one reason. Something has to die at this altar. What will you kill today here? What will you give in exchange here? What will you lay at the altar here? And here's what happens when we make that exchange. We suddenly have an identity. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The eyes of the Lord are going back and forth, looking to see whose heart is truly mine. This altar is open. I don't know your life just like you don't know mine. But you know your life. You know what you need to kill today. It could be a number of things or it could be one thing that's just really hurt your life, has hurt your walk. Let's not be almost. Let's be this guy. That at the end of the race, we would hear him say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Well done. Would you stand with me? Pastor Joe, come on. Or Rick, I don't know who's coming. Would you stand with me? You heard truth today. You heard the word. I'm not smart enough to make things up, okay? I'm just following the word and I'm following what God has, gave me, has given me to say to you.
when Abraham brought Isaac up. Two things were going on. Abraham's faith never changed. He knew God was going to do something. And the one we don't talk about, Isaac's faith was there as well. Isaac wasn't a little boy. He was a teenager by then. He said, Dad, we got the wood. We got the knife. Where's the sacrifice? In saying that, the altar's here. You bring up the wood that has harmed you. You bring up the knife. And here's the response from Abraham. And God will supply. Huh. Get rid of it. Let it go. Father, we come before you. We thank you. Lord, I've given the word the best I know how. I pray that souls do not walk out of this place the same way they came in. If we would understand what's on the other side, other side of the sacrifice. If we would understand the blessing that he has for us on the other side of the sacrifice. God, we'd be running up these altars to lay it down before you. Oh, God, we love you. We adore you. But Lord, let us not people who say it with our mouth, but let our lives reflect our love for you. Let it show this world, I am a, I am a follower of Jesus Christ. In him only do I believe. Lord, I pray that you bless this congregation. I pray, dear Father, that your spirit, the Holy Spirit sent from God the Father, the promise from Jesus would begin to move through this crowd, empowering, encouraging, lifting up. Father, I just pray today, move in us. Let us not be Christians that are almost, but let us be completely committed to you. In your precious name. Praise the Lord. We want to keep the altars open, and, and, and like you said, Bishop, thank you so much for, for the word of encouragement. If the, if the prayer team would make their way forward, he said almost. And he listed, I believe, seven things that almost make our spiritual condition almost. And we're going to open these altars before we leave. And if that is you, I would encourage you, come forward, come forward. So we can pray with you. Come forward so we can seek God's presence. Because my hand's going up. Almost. And before we leave this place this morning, the altars are open. If this message spoke to you, I'm going to have everyone close their eyes and, and bow their heads. Right there where you are. Right there where you are. Father, I believe there's people in this room that are walking the fence, that are straddling the fence. I believe, Father God, that it's, it's more like a tightrope. And they're suspended thousands of feet in the air. They're teetering on destruction, waiting to fall. I ask, Father God, if there is anybody out there this morning that has not made that decision to call your son Lord and Savior that that hand would go up right now if you're out there this morning with every head bowed and eyes closed between you and God right there where you are that those hands would go up Father and just make that life changing decision that yes Father, we know that you are a king. We know that you are Lord and Savior. And we know that we are sinful by nature. But Father, we need to take that faithful step. We need to take that faithful step. And acknowledge you as Lord and Savior. If that is you, and if you make that decision in your heart, I encourage you to come forward so we can pray over you.